ESF is the oldest, largest, and most distinguished institution in the United States that is focused on the study of natural resources and the environment. Hello and welcome to this edition of Improve Your World with SUNY ESF. I'm Dave White. If you look over my shoulder, you see an aerial view of the Thousand Islands in the St. Lawrence River. Actually, there are well over a thousand islands in the area, nearly 1,800 of them as a matter of fact. On one of them, Governor's Island near the village of Clayton, is the ESF Thousand Islands Biological Station. The island has laboratories, residential facilities, classrooms, and a spectacular view. These families are on a boat being taken across the St. Lawrence River to Governor's Island, headquarters for the Thousand Islands Biological Station. Station Director Dr. John Farrell and his team will teach the kids how to be fish scientists for the day. The kids will do a number of activities learning about the ecosystem, different wildlife habitats, and the creatures that live in and around the river. So today we have uh, the Thousand Islands Land Trust out here on a kids' trek, so they do a uh, series of uh, environmental education programs and today is uh, ichthyologist for a day so they're visiting the Thousand Islands Biological Station to, to learn about our programs and what it's like to be a fish ecologist. We had a little introductory session up at the main lodge here at the Thousand Islands Biological Station where we ta taught them a little bit about the St. Lawrence River and our research programs and now we're running them through a series of modules. Yeah, you visit that. Cool. Yeah. And we sweep yeah. this through the, through the sediments in the water and then we take this sample and we sieve it through like a, a mesh sieve and then we put it into our sorting tray. So it's very easy. The hard part is finding the organisms and identifying them. So the next thing, the next station is going to be, you guys are going to try to identify these organisms. So this is called, this is our identification station over here. And you're going to be using a dichotomous key. Do you guys know what that is? Yeah. Can you it's describe how it works? Well, it's, it is two different, it's like something that makes it completely obvious like this what this if it has such and such it goes this way it's leaning towards this if it says such and such it goes absolutely way. perfect yep so we're going to use characteristics of these organisms to separate them down and by and do that by asking questions about and moving on to the next part of the, the key and then eventually you get down to the final species that it is the right identification. We're, one, they're looking at lower trophic levels, the, the bugs and the, the insects and zooplankton, uh, some wetland organisms that uh, really serve as some of the important uh, parts of our aquatic ecosystem here, and the kids are learning about that in our, in our lab. But we made a simple one for you, so it should be okay for you to get through today. And we have nine different organisms over here that we're gonna see if you guys can identify them using our key. Um, and that'll be sort of a game too, to see how many how many organisms you guys can identify today. Some of them you might already know. Some of you might but already know, but let's but we're trying to show you what we how we use keys to solve the question of learning what we're looking at. And then our final station um, is we actually just went out and did a zooplankton grab. And I'm right if you want to mesh. show them our net back right there. So you can see oh. how fine this mesh is. It's 53 micrometers, which is very, very small. Yeah, you guys should go feel so, the mesh. So, so anything, does everyone want to touch this? So anything that's smaller than this size in between this these meshes is going to be stuck in this net, which is really small stuff, and there's a lot of stuff. So it's pretty neat. What we do is we lower this into the water. Well, usually there's a little cup on the end. Here's a little cup. See this? We clip this on. And then we just pull it up and drag it through the water. And we catch tons of stuff. And one of the important things about the fish diversity that we have is the habitat. So if you see, we have these lily pads, these big lily pads. 
to provide cover for fish and we have all of these aquatic vegetation that's under the water that provide important places for fish to, to lay their eggs. Um, but we also have invasive species, which I think you guys heard about in your talk. And this is one of those invasive species. It's called European frogs, but you guys can touch it if you want. You guys want to you wanna pet the goby? Yeah, get your hands wet. Whenever you want to touch a fish, you should get your hands wet because they have slime on them that they need to keep them healthy. Area catfish perch. perch. There's a little rock bass gar. in there as well. And there's some gar. Yeah, there's, there's a baby gar. gar. If you guys want to pet them, they, their scales are very hard. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh, we also have uh, a fish display, some higher trophic levels over in our wet lab. So we have a, a variety of fish species that are from here in the St. Lawrence that they're, they're learning about their ecology, uh, different species, their distribution, what they do here in the river in that module. And, and out here we're doing uh, a fishing display. So kids are actually catching fish, they're collecting data on the fish they catch, and it's kind of a little contest that I think they're enjoying. Oh, you know what, you shouldn't add stuff up yet because we're about fish. Let's see your fish. <laughs> 14. Now you can let it go. Well, you can throw it right back, huh? We feel strongly that when you uh, interact with children and the environment at a young age, they, they have a natural curiosity and an interest in what's going on in the environment and the natural world that you can just see. It's infectious and, uh, you know, you never know that one of them might be one of our future students. I just see a lot of excitement in their eyes. We're already way behind schedule because uh, it's hard to pull them away from the different exhibits, and I think they're having a lot of fun. Uh, we, we really do uh, community-based uh, research. Uh, it's a graduate training site. Outreach is a small part of our mission, but we're, we have three grant projects, and we're looking at some serious issues. We help manage the uh, fishery along with the Department of Environmental Conservation and, and many other partners. So there's some really interesting research in Great Lakes aquatic ecology that, that go on at this site. At the close of a very exciting day, the youngsters and their families get aboard the boat and head back to the village of Clayton. Cutting into the root ball. Am I killing these roots? You betcha. Is the plant going to grow more? You betcha. Because you got to dig a big enough hole. You always dig wide, not deep. Uh, it's much more important that you have at least at least twice the diameter of the uh, root ball that you're putting in the ground. You should have a hole at least twice. And sometimes in, in heavy clay soils, you want at least three times that diameter. You feel ridiculous when you dig this. You get a wide hole about the size of a bathtub. You put in this relatively small tree, but it really makes a big difference. The, the topmost root should be right, right at or even just slightly above the surface of the soil. You can either double or half the life of a tree on the day you plant it. So if you, if you do everything right, um, most trees will grow for the best part of a century. Even fairly, quote, short-lived trees will grow for 50 or 60 years. The Kids' Day on the island helps introduce us to the variety of projects going on at the Biological Station. We travel out on the river with a group of ESF students to take an up-close look at their research work. These students and staff are working on one of the many research projects centered at the Thousand Islands Biological Station. They're doing a fish survey. Once they reached the planned location, a small bay on the south shore of the St. Lawrence River, they donned their wetsuits and set up their equipment. Jamie has four clipboards. Yeah. They got the scale and everything, I guess, that stays. Uh, blue bin? No. Uh, are we going to process them here? Today we are assessing the fish community in the bays. We are 
um, trying to catch juvenile muscalunge, a species of our concern in the Thousand Islands Biological Station and the focus of a lot of our research. And we're trying to assess the forage fish community for the juvenile muscalunge. Fish of the head shape. Sorry, what did you say, Sam? Two UI smallmouth bass and three UI lapomes. Three bot nose and a fat head. Yep. Three. Three fat heads. The muscalunge population has gone through a depression in the past couple years. Um, that's due to viral hemorrhagic septicemia, and we have a loss of over 200 uh, adult muscalunge. Young a year bullhead. And being the trophy fish of North America, as well as being the top level predator and the focus of a lot of recreational fishing uh, on the St. Lawrence River, UAB. it's very important to bring that population back. Uh, typically, we have a three man crew on the Seine. Two will be pulling the poles at a slow, slow pace, while a third crew member will make sure the bolt, uh, bag doesn't roll up because that would allow fish to escape underneath. So, after a hundred foot haul, the two pole pullers will bring the poles together and grab the lead line on the bottom and pull that in. And once we've gotten to the bag, then we roll up the bag uh, from the inside out and we count and identify all the fish by species. I have three black chin. Four blunt nose, two clay fish. You were gonna say something first or no? Yeah, I have three blunt noses. caught about half a dozen minnow species, including black chin shiners, blunt nose minnows, fathead minnows, killifish, and uh, young bass, largemouth and smallmouth as well. Do all of those represent forage for muskies? Yeah, they all represent forage. It'll be at different stages of the muskie's life. The, the minnows at the moment are about the same size as the muskellunge, but in, in a couple weeks, by early fall, then they'll be able to eat those as well. All right, so. what are we looking at here? Uh, this is a juvenile muscalunge. It was probably spawned uh, mid mid May, and right now it's kind of making its switch from <laughs> small aquatic macroinvertebrates to a fish diet of the small minnow species we have. That fish, if if it survives, will reach maybe 35, 50 pounds. It'll take 15 or 20 years. It would end up going over 50 inches, maybe 60 inches. My name's Amy. I'm going into my senior year in aquatics and fisheries. I was assessing the habitat that we were seining through. So um, we're kind of looking at, you know, like we catch a muskie in a one place and like why are we catching a muskie here as opposed to another place? So we're looking at the submerged aquatic vegetation and we're trying to see if there's um, good vegetation where the muskie can hide, where they can swim through nice and easily. Is the water really disgusting? Is it pretty clean? Is it deep, too shallow, too warm? So we're just trying to look at the habitat and seeing if it's good for the muskie. What kind of vegetation are you seeing here? Um, over here we're seeing a lot of cara at the bottom, which is not so good for the muskie. But we're also seeing a lot of um, Ballicinaria and um, 
Pectinatus pusillus, which is really nice for the muskie because they can hide in it easily and it's um, really easy for them to move through it. Once they finish their survey of the area, they head back to Governor's Island to log in their results. This is a traditional landfill cover. This stand of shrub willow is an effort to develop an alternative landfill cover system that will also create a wildlife habitat, park and recreation area, and biomass for use in energy production. We are using these willows to control the movement of water uh, into, the, into the waste material to uh, essentially keep the water from coming in contact with the waste because uh, when that happens you get chemicals that will be, uh, become transported by the water as the water moves through the waste material. So we're trying to keep those contaminants from being transported outside these boundaries and into the groundwaters and surface waters that are adjacent to the site. And so far, the shrub willows are doing a good job preventing water from soaking deep into the ground. Eventually, 60 acres of this former industrial site will be planted in shrub willow. River research also involves tributaries and wetlands, as we see in this segment. Matt, uh, tell us what we're doing here today. What is the uh, project about? Sure. Well, today we're at uh, Carpenter's Branch, which is one of our water control sites. Uh, this is a site where we have a water control structure uh, that's been in place for uh, since 2003. And here what we're looking at is the effects of water level regulation. So we're actually regulating the water levels independently of the river here. We're trying to see what the effect is on the entire ecosystem by having water levels that are higher than what's currently being uh, regulated on the St. Lawrence River. So we're looking at different things such as uh, biogeochemistry and um, faunal linkages between uh, spawning habitats. So we're looking at how the fish respond to this uh, uh, restoration treatment. I myself am looking at the uh, wetland vegetation, so we're primarily looking at uh, cattail, which is the dominant vegetation out here. So we're looking at cattail, we're counting the stems, we're looking to see how does cattail respond to the elevated water levels. So this is a water control structure actually and it allows us to regulate the water levels upstream uh, independently of the regulation plan that's on the St. Lawrence River. Uh, this is a fish ladder that allows fish actually to uh, go upstream to find more favorable spawning habitat because again there's higher water levels here and we're pr trying to promote uh, more sedge meadow uh, habitat which they find favorable for spawning. We've had this in effect now for uh, about 10 years now so uh, it's real interesting to look at the long-term effect and over the past 10 years then in terms of vegetation and the fish community. And why are you doing it? I guess that's a, a good question is I know you're doing it but why? So what we're doing here is we're trying to look at uh, really from a holistic standpoint is how does this affect the entire ecosystem? How can we promote a diverse uh, ecosystem? How can we promote uh, water levels that will increase habitat for um, fish such as northern pike and muscalone? So we're also looking at uh, to see uh, can we uh, take care of cattail by uh, having or raising the water levels? So can we promote sedge meadows? Can we promote uh, favorable habitat for um, Musky and northern pike. Also to see uh, muskrat too, um, to see how that they respond to the elevated water levels too. So it's a holistic approach to see how does it affect the fish, how does it affect the uh, mammals, how does it affect, uh, we've even got um, one graduate student who's out here studying the uh, birds as well, amphibians. So it's really it's a holistic approach to compare from our site here where we manage the water levels independently of the river then. And we're not in St. Lawrence here. We're in a uh, creek? Uh, yes, this is a cranberry uh, branch actually. So this is a drowned river mouth uh, tributary. So this is a tributary that feeds into the St. Lawrence River. So this is a, uh, from a hydrogeomorphology uh, class, it's called a uh, drowned river mouth. And mm -hmm. the reason you're doing it out here is to 
to see the ecological impact that the tributaries uh, impact the main river from vegetation and wildlife out here? Well, what we're looking at really is that everything that's uh, being controlled uh, upstream then is going to be independent of downstream then. So we're, it's actually a really nice setup from an experimental design. So we can actually look at from a control perspective and then you go further downstream then and you can have a reference site. So you can basically look at right next to each other, right up on this bridge actually, you can even see just the effects of uh, the wa raised water levels from a treatment perspective and right across the bridge from a control perspective where there is no regulation, where we don't have a water control structure in effect then. So it's really nice to have that contrast then. Okay, so right now we're gonna navigate then to our plot here. A lot of nice meadow marsh vegetations around here right now. Now what is it that you have here? This is just a quadrat, just a meter by a meter. This is what we use uh, for surveying vegetation. So we survey all the vegetation within a one meter square quadrat. So it basically then just helps us to characterize the vegetation within uh, one meter square. So we can identify all the species, we can record their uh, species cover class, how much they take up within a one square meter plot. This is good because we can use this then for analyses. Um, we have lots of plots within the site and uh, we've been surveying these sites uh, for more than 10 years now. So we have a lot of vegetation data as well as data on um, biogeochemistry, water level fluctuations, um, including the fish habitat as well. So we have uh, 10 years worth of data for uh, the fish as well. Okay. This is a willow. Yeah, so we've got a willow too, so salix. Got both actually, from the looks of it. And uh, let's see here, Anaclea sensibilis, sensitive fern. We've got Selfield, that's a nice little flower down here. It's called Prunella vulgaris. So what's this stuff? Uh, that vine. That's a uh, Vicia cracka, the vine that you're holding in your hand. This little guy right here is Vicia cracka. It produces a nice little purple flower. Let's see, we've also got, let's see here, Cornus, Cornus amomum, which is another common shrub. And what else? We've got Calamagrostis canadensis. I think it might be, yeah. You can see it down there. So this plot's actually a lot more diverse. No, sensitive fern? Sensitive fern, there's a bit of it, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of it. So sensitive fern. Yeah, for that, I might give that like a 40. Yeah, there's a lot of 40, it. 40, I think, would be good. Yeah. How do you establish, you said, let's give it a 40, let's give this a 2, let's give this a 20. Right. Well, what we do is uh, we just estimate that based on how much uh, does the plant cover the entire plot then. So we think of all the species then. So we think of, we've got all these different species and they could each actually have uh, more than 100% cover in plot. The reason why is because it's a three-dimensional uh, cube if you think about it when you're looking down you have a canopy structure if you think about it where you have things that could actually be on top of each other so within a plot you could actually have more than 100 percent coverage so when we're doing a vegetation uh, plot uh, we can use cover classes where we just say is this a one is this a two three four five uh, out of five where we can think of as one just being between zero and five percent and a two meaning uh, between five and 15 percent and so on uh, but for accuracy it's really good actually to see if you can get um, a whole number out of a hundred so if you can get a whole number out of a hundred then uh, that would actually help more with analyses later on and it's the dominant plant out here and it's crowded out actually uh, some beneficial habitat for fish and wildlife so the cattail has actually uh, crowded out and it's encroached upon sedge meadows where you're standing right now actually and where we walked through, there were more sedges. So because we've been surveying these over time, then we're actually able to look at then how uh, cattail is either encroached or it hasn't diminished then within these uh, sedge meadow habitats. What we're gonna do now first is we're just going to count typhus stems. So 
Eric, uh, you're just gonna grab then all the way down at the bottom. You'll see that all the leaves go down to the bottom. Yeah. That's one whole stem. So Perfect. we're just gonna count stems. Perfect. So we're gonna divide the plot in half so both of us can do it. Yeah. Um, so from this pole right here, diagonally across to the opposite corner, I'll take the side that I'm on, you take the side that you're on. All right. We'll measure uh, water depth and maximum type of height. So just measure water depth here. Water depth is at 12 inches. And maximum height, which one do you think is the tallest? That guy, this guy. Yeah, that guy's pretty tall. So here, let me just grab him here. That's about 105 inches. That's uh, two different wetland vegetation plots. One obviously has a lot more cattail in it. One has more diversity. And uh, we see a lot of different plants out here. So it's really interesting to see how they differ along the elevation gradient, as well as a location re relative to the water control structure site. The further that you go upstream, actually, the more diverse it is. Just want to break down the quadrat. There you go. These poplar trees are hard at work, cleaning up what was a landfill. It's a process called phytoremediation. Well, phytoremediation is the use of plants to clean up environmental contamination. So we can look at using plants to take up and sequester heavy metals, or in the case of these poplar trees, to take up organic compounds and break them down into non-toxic byproducts. Well, if you put something in a landfill, you are putting it in there and keeping it safe and not letting anything come in contact with it, which means whatever you put in there is staying in there. It's not going away. In some cases, the trees can be harvested and safely turned into useful products. On the other hand, if the contaminant is a heavy metal like lead or chromium, Phytoremediation offers a recycling opportunity. And we can reclaim that metal by harvesting the plants and extracting the metals from them. So we're completely removing it from the environment rather than just putting it someplace and keeping it there for future generations to have to deal with. I love the closing shots with the sound of the students' boots sloshing through the water because for much of the segment, it doesn't look like it's that wet out there. That's when you realize they really are in a wetland. Well, that's it for this edition of Improve Your World with SUNY ESF. Thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you again next time.